Um, my name is Rachel Westbrook, and on behalf of the Conservation Commission, I'm really pleased to welcome Barry Genslinger, to, who is the state's only dedicated rehabber of sick, weak, or injured bats, um, working in a place he and his wife Maureen call the Bat Cave, also known as the Vermont Bat Center. Um, they take in 30 to 50 bats a year, um, and they field calls from all over Vermont, including right here in Randolph, um, taking in bats when they're found hurt or struggling in places they don't belong. Um, they started out as bat fans, building houses for bats on their property. They later started the Karakura <coughs> Cabin Company, selling over 4,000 certified bat houses all over North America. Since 2001, Barry has been presenting educational programs to schools and community groups, and we're really excited to have him here with us this evening. Please give him a warm welcome. Hey. The thing that makes a successful program about bats is for you to get all your questions answered. And I don't know what those are. So I got a bunch of stuff I can talk about. But if while I'm talking, if you come up with a question, ask the question. Don't wait till the end of the program because you'll forget the question and I probably won't have answered it. So um, we, we also happen to have one very special thing today that will probably not happen in another bat program for a long time. One of our bats that we overwintered actually came from Randolph, right down the street. Our license says we have to release wildlife back where it came from, which is why I'm here today, because I brought the bat with me, and it will be released tonight down at the golf course uh, on the ninth hole. No, no, no. It'll, it'll be, a, we'll release it, I think, I've never been to the golf course, but it looked like a good place to really release it at the driving range. If anybody's ever been down there, is that a good place? Sure. Yeah. yeah. The bat won't working. care. The thing about bats is I could have released this bat up in Milton, Vermont, and it would have come back here. Oh, it knows yeah. where it belongs, yeah. and it would have made its way back here. But since I had the bat, and I have to release it, near where it came from. I don't have to release it exactly where it came from because Harvey got it out of his house and he would not be happy if I released it back <laughs> in his house. So, uh, at the end of my program, anyone who would like to go down to the golf course, I will be happy to continue talking about the bat that I have there and uh, how he's doing and uh, then we'll turn him loose. Now, letting a bat go, is one of the least exciting things that you can imagine. You take him out of the cage, you hold him in your hand, you open your hand, he's gone. It's like that quick. Uh, so I, I always try to give him a couple mealworms before he takes off so he's got a little full belly and he can go out and start eating bugs. So that'll be exciting. Uh, well, for me it'll be exciting. <laughs> so you may not care. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the bat will be very excited because he's been in this little cage in our hibernation area, sound asleep for a long time. Uh, so now we'll let him go and he'll go do what he's supposed to do, which is eat bugs. But he's not going to go back to Harvey's house. Not, well, my guess is that Harvey has some way that that bat got into his house to start with and the bat knows it. So within a couple hours of feeding tonight, he'll be back in the attic. But that's all right. Harvey's at a board meeting up in Burlington, so he won't know. <laughs> he called me this morning and said, I see from our front porch forum that you're going to be down in Randolph and I'm going to be up in Burlington at a board meeting, so I'm going to miss you. And I said, that's all right. We're letting the bat go in your house. <laughs> your friend's coming back. All right. So, um, many people don't know that bats are among the most plentiful mammals on the planet. Uh, bats make up approximately one-fifth of all the mammal species on Earth. Uh, as of the uh, count from 2022, there were 1,463 known species of bats. That's more than all the uh, species of cats, dogs, horses, cows, and pigs combined. So there are lots of different species of bats, and they come from all over the planet. 
So I always like to start just with a quick overview, if, if my fingers will click properly. There we go. A quick overview of the bats from around the world so you get an idea of the variety. Most people just think of bats as this kind of an ugly brown or dark colored animal, big teeth, flies around ripping people's jugular veins <laughs> off. That would, be, that would be a vampire, yeah. We'll talk more about vampire bats in a minute. So uh, bats take on a variety of forms. I mean, did anybody ever read the book Stella Luna? The author of the book Stella Luna had this particular bat, Wahlberg's epauletted fruit bat. Uh, epaulets are these little white things right here. And uh, this particular bat has a baby bat that's flying with it, which is the, the whole impetus for Stella Luna. And the mother bat actually carries the baby bat when it's young and goes out. She goes out and feeds, carrying the baby with her. And in the book Stella Luna, well, Stella wasn't paying very good attention and ended up falling. So that's the whole, you have to read the book now. I'm not <laughs> telling you the punchline. So some bats are very tiny. This bat weighs about the same as a paper clip. Very tiny, very lightweight. And this one, the other end of the spectrum, a fruit bat has a six foot wingspan. That's the distance from the ends of my fingers. And this one weighs about two pounds. So you got these little teeny, teeny, teeny ones and these great big ones. If I didn't tell you this was a bat, you might say, oh, what a cute puppy dog. <laughs> it looks like a puppy dog. It happens to be in the class of bats called flying foxes because its face resembles the face of a fox. But has great big round eyes and kind of small ears. That tells us one thing about this bat. It's a fruit-eating bat. Fruit-eating bats have big eyes so they can look around and find a fruit tree. They don't have big huge ears because they don't use echolocation to find a fruit tree. They just use their eyes and say, oh, there's a tree, yeah. On the other hand, an insectivore, <laughs> a bat that eats bugs, needs a way of finding bugs, little tiny bugs in the dark. So it has big ears and kind of small eyes because he, he doesn't need to see the bug while he's flying along in the dark at 20 miles an hour. He just needs to hear where it is. So he uses his echolocation to focus in on where that bug is. More about that coming up. Some bats have some really strange anatomical features like this nose thing. Uh, biologists call it a nose leaf because it resembles a leaf being stuck on the end of the nose. But uh, we're not quite sure what they do with that. Originally it was, oh, bats that are insectivores are the ones with nose leaves. But then there are some fruit eating bats that have nose leaves, so that blew that idea. Some bats have really tiny, tiny, tiny eyes, but those big ears are the giveaway. Uses echolocation because it's got those big ears. And here's another with a big nose leaf. Big ears, small eyes. If I'm in your way, I'll try and duck down. You can also look back there because I'm seeing what I'm doing back there. <laughs> I love this bat with, with its gold colored wings. And this, of course, back in the day when I first started doing this, I had lots of bushy hair. Now I don't have hardly any, but I had lots of bushy hair. And I always thought I should get one of those haircut mohawk things. We call that a mohawk. <laughs> But it actually was from a different tribe. It wasn't from the Mohawk Indians. And this guy was in the mind of the person who developed the Creatures for Gremlins, a movie back in the day. Had that freaky little thing. Now this guy is the only slide I've shown you so far that's right side up. All the other ones were upside down because bats hang upside down. Their entire anatomy is built to do things upside down. So he's hanging from a tree. He happened to just finish eating a fig. He's a fruit eating bat. We know that because look at those eyes, big eyes, little ears. 
Got those epaulets on his ears. So he's hanging upside down. He's got a mouth full of fruit. He's chewing away on the fruit. And all the juice from the fig that he just ate is running down into his nose. So I have a video of this guy and his nose is trying to lap all of this juice that's running down into his nose to catch up with it. We call him Figgy Piggy. <laughs> and these guys, fabulous little tiny, tiny bats. This is another one of those groups that are the very small bats, about an inch and a half tall. And this particular group, beautiful white color, and they live under the leaves. This is looking straight up under the leaf of a palm tree. Now what, normally a palm tree leaf goes like this, kind of curves upward. And these bats, if you look closely, you can see where they have chewed along the spine of this leaf, all the way across both sides of the spine, so that the leaf folded down like this to make a little tent, and they live underneath it. And the sunlight coming through the leaf turns that beautiful white fur the appearance of green, and they're almost invisible to any predators. What a cool idea. And when the leaf dies, because they chewed down the spine, they just move to another leaf, make a new tent. And the clever scientists call this one the wrinkle-faced bat. <laughs> First, I'm not sure why. Uh, some bats have some really odd features like this. And here's Stella Luna again. And this guy has a tongue that is one and a half times the length of its body. The reason it's trying to get something out of that tube is because scientists were trying to figure out a way of measuring the length of the tongue without grabbing it and pulling it. So they just kept adding nectar to a longer and longer tube to see how long, how far down the tube the bat would get its tongue. So what does it do with that tongue when it pulls it back into its mouth? It, does it have a mouth full of tongue? Well, no. The tongue is actually anchored here in the top part of the chest. So when it retracts the tongue, it retracts it into the top of the chest rather than in its mouth. So that's why it doesn't choke on its own tongue. Question from the yes. chat. Do um, the bats that eat fruit, do they use any echolocation at all? Or just a little but not much? Once they get to a tree in the dark, they can use the echolocation so they don't run into branches. All the bat species are capable of echolocation, but frugivores do not need echolocation to find a tree. It's not very often that a tree runs away from them. So once they see, well, they, they know where they're going. Good question. Do you know what kind of flower this tongue might have been adapted to? Um, there, there are a number of flowers in South America that have very long tubular um, I forget the name of that part of the flower, long tubular part of the flower. So the bat sticks his head in the top, but to get at the nectar, he needs that long tongue to get down there. So did you say the tongue is outside when he's Nope, running? nope. It's pulled back into the he's mouth, but, but it's anchored into the top of the chest rather than our tongues are anchored into the back of our throats. Uh, in, in the, not at the top, at the bottom. So his is just anchored further back. And so it can be pulled back in without choking them. So are those bats pollinators then? Uh, these, these would be among the species of pollinators, yes. And I'll talk more about those. So we got, we got this huge variety of bats from all over the world. Uh, here in Vermont, we only have nine species. So out of all those species of bats, there's only nine species that live here in Vermont. I'll talk more about those in a minute. Uh, there are about 43 or 44 species in the United States. Where the heck are all the other ones? South America, the rainforests have got hundreds and hundreds of different species. Uh, in fact, the bats in the rainforest, when we humans go in and cut down all those trees in the rainforest so we can have farm fields and do whatever and we want the wood and all kinds of rationale for why we should cut the rainforest down. The bats are the ones who eat the fruit and fly over those opened areas 
and their guano contains the seeds to reseed the rainforest. Not make the rainforest reseed, but reseed the rainforest. So they're planting all the seeds, so all the new growth in the rainforest started from bats that were flying across the area. So let's just do a quick review of some of the things that bats eat, because bats eat, I mean, you, you can't imagine all the things that bats eat. There are approximately 750 different species of bats that eat insects, and they eat all kinds of insects. One of the ways they catch insects, they're all uh, those that use echolocation. So they're flying along, they're chasing a, a bug, they get the echolocation hit on the bug, and now how do they catch it? Do they fly up and just snag it in their mouth? Well, no, actually, they have this big net with them. It's called a wing, and they fly up, and when they get right up to the bug, they just take that big net and go whee, and scoop it into their body. Some species throw it into their tail membrane and then get back to flying and bend down and grab it out of the tail membrane. Um, so it's a very efficient way of catching bugs. But they don't just eat flying insects. They can eat, they glean, they can pick insects off the ground in flight. So they will eat crickets and grasshoppers. And this particular species likes these millipedes or centipedes. And they are actually, this species is actually able to land on the ground, pick up a bug, and then take off again. There are a lot of species that can't do that. Yes, go ahead. They certainly could. They are very efficient insect predators. Uh, there was one picture there of a cricket sitting on top of a cactus. Well, that, that cricket didn't actually just wind up on the cactus. It was put there on the cactus by Merlin Tuttle and his crew trying to get a picture of a bat coming in to pick up a bug. So they put the cricket on the cactus and the bat came in and picked it up off the cactus for them. It was a trained bat, believe it or not. <laughs> but it looked good in the picture, didn't it? Like, wow, look at that. All right. Oh, this is one of my favorite pictures. This guy's able to handle a scorpion without getting stung. So, a wide variety of things in the world of insects that bats eat. Then we have about 250 or more species that are frugivores. And they like eating what we would consider to be overripe fruit. They don't like crunchy, hard fruit. They like squishy fruit that they can take a bite of, squish all of the juice and the good pulp out of it, and then spit the part out they don't like. So they will grab a piece of fruit like this and hang from it. Or they will grab a piece of fruit, pull it off the vine, and take it with them like Figgy Piggy did. And then they go to their favorite tree and, that they're going to hang on while they're eating their fruit. This guy's picking a piece of dura fruit up. He'll take off with that in his mouth, go find his favorite tree branch to hang on while he's eating that fruit. But notice he's picking the one that's overripe, not the green one, not the one that's rock hard. He wants the one that's easy for him to chew. Do the bats get drunk off of their overripe fruit is a question? Good question. <laughs> to my knowledge, <laughs> they are not fermented fruit. They are just at the point of being squishy. So they would not be fermented. I do have a group of birds who come by every year in the spring and eat all of the cherries that have spent the entire winter and they are fermented, and they're all drunk, and they all end up splashing in my pool and doing weird stuff. <laughs> so our frugivores eat all kinds of fruit. They're, they um, like overripe fruit, and we, we have recently, we scientists have recently done some studies because fruit farmers said it's the bats that are eating all of our good fruit. So they did a study. They put some tags on bats that they knew were feeding on fruit in the area. 
big huge orchards and way over there five miles away a whole bunch of wild fruit trees where did the bats go to the orchard no they went to the wild they've been eating wild fruit for the past two million years they don't care about cultivated fruit so they proved to the farmers you've got your fruit the bats aren't touching them they want the stuff they've been eating forever so then we've got nectar eating bats bats that uh, take their meal from inside of an assortment of flowers and of course in doing that they also are pollinators so here's a bat coming up to a cactus flower out in the western part of the united states He's going to stick his head inside that flower to get at the nectar. The nectar is way down here. So he sticks his head in. Notice how long his neck is and how long his snout is. It's a perfect fit for those flowers. They are, by the way, one of the only pollinators of the agave and saguaro cacti out in the western United States. Who cares about that? Well, if you like tequila. <laughs> this is what it looks like after a good day of getting nectar from flowers. They are covered in pollen and have spent their night pollinating flowers all across the desert areas of the United States. Totally different method that a symbiotic relation between a plant and a bat has developed. Here, the nectar is way down here, but the pollen is up here. And when the bat goes in to get the nectar, the pollen comes off on its back. So it goes flower to flower to flower, carrying the pollen on its back while it dives into the flower. So these nectar bats have really long tongues then? Um, they have long necks and pointed snouts. Their tongues are not terribly long because this guy is going to go halfway into that flower. If, I, if we have time, one of the problems I have is I get going on these things and we realize after about two and a half hours, it's like, <laughs> I'm hungry. Let's get out of here. So we've got to be careful about that. But in the event that there's time, I'll pull a video up of one of these guys actually feeding on a flower as it's going. So then we got seven species that are carnivores, meat eaters. They eat a wide variety of meat. They eat frogs, they eat lizards, they eat snakes, they, eat, they have very strong jaws and very sharp teeth. If you look closely at that guy's teeth, you can see he's got some serious teeth going on there. They will catch a frog and they will eat the whole thing. So, I, I have some video if anybody wants some really gory stuff of a bat eating an entire lizard. <laughs> then we have a bunch of bats that eat fish. Now you'll wonder to yourself, how the heck does a bat catch a fish? Hmm. They, they have little, little tiny fishing rods, little Orvis. <laughs> um, a bat catches a fish the same way it would use echolocation to catch a bug, but it's looking instead for the circles in the water. When a fish comes up and grabs a bug, it makes those ripples. And a bat knows at the middle of those ripples, there's a fish. And it comes flying in. with its feet, if you look closely at those feet, very long toes with right angle toenails that are sharp as a razor. And it drags those in the water as it's flying by and hooks the fish and picks it right up, throws it right into its mouth and goes off to eat it in its favorite fish eating tree. Well, I wondered that myself. And I've got another one at the end of this of a bat getting a drink. And I'll tell you the story w when we get there. So what's missing? What's missing? Oh, vampire. Oh, yeah, vampire. vampire bats. Vampire bats are real. 
They just aren't real the way Hollywood has convinced us that vampire bats are real. Vampire bats are tiny. They're about this tall. Uh, they don't have big long fangs. They are stealth. They feed on blood, but that's a chicken. Standard size, this is not big bird, it's just a regular sized chicken. So there's a chicken and there are two vampire bats. And the vampire bat waits for the chicken to get in the tree and go to sleep. It lands on the branch and sneaks up underneath the tree and the, uh, underneath the branch and then comes around and it licks the edge of the toenail to soften the skin up. It uses its, its very sensitive nose to figure out where is the nearest blood vessel. And it makes a tiny little paper cut. Doesn't even wake the chicken up. The chicken doesn't even move. But it makes this little nip and now it just waits. Drop of blood comes out, it licks up the drop of blood and its saliva has an anticoagulant in it so another drop of blood comes out. And it feeds until it's drained the chicken totally dry of blood and it blows away in the wind. No. <laughs> a vampire bat will eat about half a thimble full. A thimble, for those that don't know, is a little tiny cup about this tall. They eat half a thimble full of blood. And so this guy is going to eat his fill, then he's going to take off and his partner there is not going to make another bite. He's just going to move in and continue to lick until the, he's had his fill. They take off. The next few drops of blood wash away the anticoagulant. Bat wake, uh, the chicken wakes up in the morning, doesn't even know anything happened. So that's the real story of vampire bats. Don't believe what Graham's, Graham Stoker tried to convince us of. So here's a picture of a bat this this will really blow your mind. Here's a picture of a bat getting a drink. How in the heck did the photographer end up right there at that exact instant to get that picture? And the answer is he wasn't even there. He had a circle of cameras that all had electronic eyes that tripped the cameras when something came through. So a bat flies across the pond to get a drink and 28 cameras all took pictures of it. And after you do that enough times, one of them must be a bat flying right at the camera, don't you think? Uh, yeah. That's how this picture was done. <laughs> and of course, when they hit the water, water splashes everywhere. And sometimes when they're getting a drink, if they're getting a drink out of a lake or out of a fast running brook, they get a little too close to the water. And when they hit the water, they end up in the water. So they have to swim over to shore and dr climb up on something and dry out and then climb a tree and take off. Sometimes you might see, if, if you're on a farm, you might see those big huge tubs that they fill with water for the livestock. And there's a big heavy piece of rope that goes down into the water. What the heck is that for? Because bats fly across to get a drink and if they end up in the water, they can't get out. But if there's a rope in there, they swim around and climb up the rope and psh, they're gone. So how do they swim? What do they use oh, to swim? They, well, they're, they, they have arms just like we do. They're called wings on a bat, but those actually they're arms. And so they swim, just paddling along. Say that again. Could they like float with their wings? Like they probably float very well. And, and if you, if you just take this picture, here's a bat's thumb and one, two, three, four fingers. Here's the forearm, elbow, upper arm. This is an arm just like us. Bats being mammals, they have the same body parts we do. So when a bat wants to fly, it just opens up its hand and the hand forms the wing, which is why all the bats of the world are in the order Chiroptera, which means hand wing. Chiroptera. Other questions? Anybody? Okay. So, there's things bats eat. 
So now, we, in, in, here in Vermont, we only have nine species of bats. I always think that we kind of got cheated. If there's 1,463 species, why don't we have more than nine? Well, the answer is, for the past couple of million years, all the stuff that those bats like to eat is found in the northeast part of the United States. So the species that we have here in Vermont, in upper state New York, and Maine, and Connecticut, Massachusetts, those are all the same species. As, as we get further south, there are a couple more species that join the crew, but they've been around forever. And bats, years and years and years and years ago, bats lived in bat houses that were huge old growth trees. We, we think of big trees as, you know, they're this big around. But a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, big trees were huge. And when they died, they died standing. And they got big holes in them. And the bats moved into those big open areas in the trees. And they lived inside those huge trees. So I want to talk about the bats of Vermont. And well, let me talk about echolocation first. I have a question. I yes. It is not legal to own bats or any other wildlife. And at the Bat Center, we don't own any of the bats. We simply care for them. Uh, most of the bats that we get in come in the fall and early winter when bats are supposed to be going into hibernation and end up inside people's houses. And the weather gets cold. You can't just throw them outside because they'll freeze to death. So they get them to us. We have a facility where we can take care of them for the winter. We have a cave, cave, that we can keep them in where the temperature is the same as it would be in a real cave. It never changes. It's between uh, 55 and 60 degrees all the time. So they go in there and they go to sleep just like it, they were in a cave or they were in somebody's attic. But echolocation. All of those insectivores use echolocation, which means they make a sound that goes out and bounces off everything. And they learn the difference between the echo coming back to them for a bug, a moth, a mosquito, um, a bus, a house. I mean, they, they know their environment. So every bat, every species of bat, makes a different kind of echo, or a different kind of echolocation pulse. So if we were to take this thing, I encourage you to run out and buy one of these. They're only $375. You can get these at Amazon.com. So this is a little device that you plug in, I have one that happens to plug into the series of i things, iPads, iPhones, iPods, i everythings. Uh, the current ones, I've had this for many years, but the current ones are all Android and plug into all Android devices. Um, but when you plug them in and download the software, you plug them in like this, you download the software, and this can be used to listen as a bat flies by. And it shows you on the screen, it shows you the pattern. You hear the echoes, and the echoes are different for all these different species. So you hear the echoes. Uh, you can set it to listen for the species that would be in Florida or Tennessee or uh, New York or wherever you happen to be. And it will tell you the bat that just flew by was Eptiscus fuscus or Myotis lucidicus. It'll tell you the species. Uh, so you don't even have to look it up anywhere. It just hears that echolocation pattern and it knows the pattern goes with a particular bat species. So here is what echolocation happens to sound like for different species. So this sounds to us like a bunch of chirps. It's actually thousands of pulses going by so fast but to us, it sounds like a continuous noise. And this particular bat is a Mexican free tail bat. And that's the way it echolocates to catch its insect. Pardon me, echo. 
happens. This one um, has a completely different type of echolocation. And you'll see from this how this machine is able to tell which cat is which. If you listen carefully, you can actually hear this bat hunting and then catching a bug. You'll hear the feeding buzz. Ready? Caught a bug. <laughs> this is one of the species we have here in Vermont, the silver hair bat. Easy to tell when it catches a bug. Got one. So these recordings were made just by listening where bats were known to be flying around. Turn the recorder on this little device on, and every time a bat went by, so run right out and buy one. Everybody share. Okay. So this, uh, I'll do more demonstrations of that if anybody is interested. So. Now the bats of Vermont. All of our bats are insectivores. We've got nine different species. Here's the kicker. Nine different species and five are on either the threatened or endangered species list. Which means they are in the same classification as uh, peregrine falcons, bald eagles, uh, Soft-shell turtles, all those things that we hear about on the news all the time, but nobody ever talks about the bats and the nine species and the five species that are endangered. So people think, middle of winter, I got a bat, I'm throwing it outside. Well, what if that was one of the endangered species? Can you tell the difference? Well, no, but oh, you probably shouldn't have thrown it out there then. So, let me talk about the different kinds of insectivores we have in Vermont. And for each of these, if you look here and down here, you'll see this, these are house bats. This particular species that I'm showing you now, a big brown bat, that's Atiscus fuscus. Can you spell that? <laughs> no. So house bats are bats that live in house-like structures. They live in bat houses, attics, garages. They don't hibernate in those houses necessarily, but they might. You might find a bat in your attic, but he actually hibernates downtown in one of the abandoned buildings for the winter because he can be in uh, there all winter long in peace and quiet. So we try and identify both summer and winter. This particular species is a house bat in the summertime and in the winter hibernates in house-like structures, could be any kind of a building, or occasionally we will find them in caves. This particular guy weighs a half an ounce. It's the most plentiful bat that we have here in Vermont. It used to be that the little brown bat, Myotis lucidicus, was the most plentiful bat in all of North America. And now it's on the endangered species list. How did that happen? More about that in a minute. So, big brown bat, little brown bat. Boy, do they look the same. What's the word, calcar? Calcar? Calcar. Is that beach? No. Uh, in the ear, we have a tragus. On the heel of the bat, we have a cow car. It's a little cartilage growth that comes out the edge of the uh, wing membrane right at the heel of the bat. And sometimes it's straight, and sometimes it's got a keel on it like a boat, a little, just a little, little dip like the keel on a boat. So we, we say these bats have a keeled cow car. Now, why, does, why do we use things like that? Because in the dark, bat species look very similar. They're brown with slight dark markings. 
and then you need something more. Is it bigger than my thumb? Oh, could be a big brown bat. Smaller than my thumb? Oh, could be any one of many species. So we need something beyond that. So we look at how long are the hairs on the toe? How does it have a keel calcar? So all those are little things that you see listed under the description that help us identify a particular species. So this guy is on the endangered species list for a reason. Notice he's a house bat. In the summertime, he spends his time in houses, in buildings of some kind. But look where he goes in the winter. They go into caves. Now, that's not a big deal until 2006. In 2006, a fungus somehow came from Europe to a cave outside of Albany, New York. And the fungus is a cold, damp, loving fungus that likes caves, which happens to be where our cave bats go. So this fungus decided it was going to grow on the surface of the skin of the bats, and it makes them itch. So they wake up and they scratch and they wiggle around, and then they go back to sleep. And a week later they wake, scratch, wiggle around, go back to sleep because the fungus is irritating them. So instead of sleeping all winter, they are waking up way, way too often, and they burn up all their fat reserve, and by the time it gets to be February, their body clock says, I'm hungry and thirsty, must be spring, and out they go, out of the cave, into freezing cold weather, and freeze to death. Not just one or two, millions and millions of them were flying out because this fungus made a itch. One cave, Albany, New York, 2006. 2007, four caves, two states. 2008, 12 caves, five states. By the time we got up to 2019, across the Mississippi River and all the way over to Oregon. So this fungus is now all over the place and affecting all of the cold dwelling cave bats because that's what the uh, fungus like. Yes? These are fungus the bomb, right? Yes. So, any of those where we see winters in caves are in trouble. So here we go. That's two bats so far. One's endangered, the other is not. Whoops. Oh, there we go. A little delay there. Hold on. Ah. <laughs> Hold still. Ah. It's coming, it's coming. There we go. The northern small-footed bat. Forest bat. Cave bat in the winter. So that means it's going to be in trouble because it has the same problem as the uh, little brown bat. But what does it mean, forest bat? If I put up a bat house on the side of my building, will I ever expect to see an eastern small-footed bat in it? No. Their habitat is in the forest. And in the wintertime, they go to caves to overwinter, which is why they're on the threatened or the endangered species list. So then we have, so that's two of the three that are on the threatened or endangered list. Here we have the northern long-eared bat. You can tell the difference between a northern long-eared bat and a big brown bat because it has long ears. When you look at the two, you'll go, wow, this guy's got really long ears. Noticeably longer. That other one, the small-footed bat, when you look at that compared to one of the others and you look at their feet, you say, wow, this guy's got really tiny feet. That's because it's a small footed. You had a question? These are also really tragic. Yes. Definite difference in shape. The tragus in the ear for a northern long-eared bat is like a dagger. It is very long and comes to a very sharp point. Of course, we're talking about something that's only this long. But it comes to a point. So it's easy to tell when you look at it. This is a northern long-eared, not a little brown, not a big brown because looking at that tragus, it makes it clear. 
So, another cave bat. It forests in the summertime, caves in the winter, on the threatened or the endangered species list. <coughs> Indiana bat. <coughs> so the Indiana bat is on the federally endangered species list for the, exactly the same reason. It's the, the fact that it's going into caves in the wintertime that are causing the problem. And then the tricolored bat, another one that's on the endangered species list, each one of these got there because it's a cave bat and the fungus got into the cave and that's the thing that has caused the problem. And then we have the silver hair. Now we're getting into the big, big bats. Huge, huge bats here in Vermont. This is a migratory bat. He doesn't mess around in the whole hibernation thing and going into a cave. He just goes south. He flies south, but he's three inches tall, weighs two-fifths of an ounce. He's huge. He's called a silver hair because every hair has a silver tip on it. And the red bat, another one of those. That he's a forest bat, but he migrates in the wintertime, heads south for the winter. It looks a bit rodent-like in the picture, at least. Say it again? It looks a bit like a rodent. Yeah, he, um, and if you saw one, he's not very tall. He's three and a half inches tall, weighs one ounce. So he, he's not like this big. He's a little tiny thing. And he's, most of the time he looks like just what you're looking at. He's got a very short face. So he looks really small. He pulls those wings in and he looks really tiny. He looks a lot like a um, guinea pig, only a miniature size. And this is our granddaddy of them all. Weighs one ounce. Biggest bat we have here in Vermont. He's enormous. Another one who forests in the summertime and then migrates south. How far south? They don't just go down to New York. They go to Tennessee, Florida. They go a long way. And they return to exactly the same spot where they left. They know, bats know how to go where they're supposed to be. <coughs> so, those are our nine species. And the reason that those are on the threatened or endangered species list is because they are cave bats. So, Let's talk about white nose fungus. Anybody want to try and pronounce that mm -hmm. proper name? The fungus is Pseudogeomagnocus destructus. We call it PD, much easier. So I'll spare you the details of all of the bat species, or the bats we had in caves. Um, and in Haley's cave, we had 15,000 bats mm -hmm. in 2006, 7,000 in 2007. That's one year half population gone. Fewer than 1,000 in 2008, and now there are virtually none. Last survey, there were no bats found. So, this is, uh, Dorset, Vermont has the largest hibernation area for bats in Vermont. And it's a cave at the, way up at the top of Mount Aeolus. The cave goes straight down and is a perfect location for bats to spend their winter. The fungus, of course, got in there. And the first time the biologists went up, this would be in 2007 uh, winter survey, they went up there and they found carcasses of tens of thousands of bats mm -hmm. on the ground because they had come out, didn't figure out, gee, it's still cold, we should go back in because their body clock is saying, go eat. You're running out of energy, go eat. So they would hang around the opening of the cave and all those little dots that you see are thousands of dead bats all over the ground. Peter, do they know how the fungus spread from cave to cave like across, the, across the US? Well, the big question is, how did it get from a cave in Europe uh. to a cave in Albany, New York? That's the big question and it's as yet unanswered. We know how it spread once it got there. Bat goes into the cave. Bat gets the spores of the fungus on it. 
spores of fungi are incredibly tough to get rid of. So that bat happens to be one who wintered in a cave in Albany, but he spent his summers at a cave in northern Maine, uh, at a house in northern Maine. So he left the cave and went up to Maine with the fungus on him. So he carried the fungus, deposited the spores of the fungus in a new cave. Now the cave became infected with a fungus. And of course, out of the thousands and thousands of bats that were in that first cave, they all went somewhere. So it went in a matter of two years from one cave in Albany, New York, to the new area in 2008. It has now spread to multiple locations. I'll just click through these and you'll see how rapidly it spread. 2010, 11, 12. And then all of a sudden, we zoom back because the next year, all the way to the West Coast. And then we started seeing it on the West Coast, down in Texas. So anywhere that those bats were spending their winters and coming out and carrying it somewhere else, it was just spreading like crazy. And of course, back in, when, when this was first discovered, the big question was, with this huge, huge decline in the species, a cave that used to have a quarter of a million little brown bats in it, now has 15,000. In another couple of years, are they going to be extinct in that cave? That was the big question. Could you wait outside those caves, like the time when they would have to come out and rehabilitate at least some to save the species? That would be a great idea. If we could put somebody up on top of that mountain in Dorset, on Mount Aeolus, and every time a bat came out, they would collect it and bring it up to us. Could we then I don't take, think you could take care of all of them, but at least a few. <laughs> we do every year. The scientists, the, see, here's the deal. You cannot intentionally go and take wildlife. That's against the law. So they could not open the gates to the cave and go into the cave and collect all the bats that were within 50 feet of the entrance. What they can do is if they are outside the cave, they can pick them up and bring them to us. So every year we do, in fact, get them. The problem is it is a four-hour walk down from the mountain, then a four-hour drive up to us. Very stressful on bats that are already in serious problem. They are outside the cave, could have been there for days. So it's very difficult. It would be great if we could station somebody up there all the time, and every time a bat came out, we collect it, but that just isn't going to work. So it would be great if we could do that. And when we get the bats, we use betadine, an iodine solution. We use a very dilute betadine uh, solution and put it on their wings and <laughs> kills the fungus instantly. So we are able to get the fungus off the bats, and now they do their part in recovery. I'll show you some pictures of that in just a second. Yes? Um, couldn't you just put food and water inside the cave? Well, you could. The problem is when they come out, they are already stressed. They are... Um, no, in the cave. Yeah, but as they're... Well, in the cave. The cave is, I think, seven miles long. Mm -hmm. It's a big, huge cave. So trying to put food in there for the bats would not be... Very practical, pretty tough to do. And trying to kill the fungus, we can kill fungi, that's no problem. We have antifungal stuff. The problem is every cave has got thousands of different fungi that are all good. It's just the one that is no good. But what we discovered over time, Mother Nature figures this thing out over in Europe. Fungus is in the caves, doesn't affect the bats. There are thousands and thousands of bats. Over here, we are beginning to see a slow increase in the population of bats in our caves, very slow, which says they are adapting. One of the observations was in Dorset, the bats have moved deeper into the cave 
where it's too cold for the fungus. So they are able to make it all the way through the winter without the fungus, and then they come out. So they're figuring this out. Without us trying to do anything, it appears as though the bats are doing what Mother Nature has done for the past thousands and millions of years. So yes. how does the fungus get started in the first place? Well, when, when a spore comes over here, uh, fungi travel as spores, mic little microscopic. If a climber was spelunking in a cave in Europe and got it on their rope, and years later went down into a cave in Albany, New York, those spores came out of the climbing gear and end up in the cave. Perfect environment for the fungus. It starts blossoming, and now it gets on the bats. Are they only in caves, or do they get on trees and house walls? or Cold, wet environments. So that is cave environment. It also happens to be every rock crevice in our granite faces, every crack, every slag pile from mining operations where they pulled out tons and tons of rock and just piled it all up. That, look, they are all filled with the fungus way down inside, and it happens. That's where northern long-eared bats like to spend their winter. That's where small-footed bats go in the winter, because they can bur burrow way down under these enormous piles and work their way back out in the spring. So, so, so in Europe, the reason that it's not affecting bats there, is it because those bats over... 500,000 years are also in the colder areas, or it doesn't affect those particular species, or is there something we, else going on there? We think it's just a matter of, and we don't know how long the fungus has been there, but it's suspected it's been there for like a million years. But it, there's never been a connection between European caves until we humans came along, European caves, and northern North American caves, because we were, we're able to make that transition. The bats can't fly that far, so they wouldn't have transmitted. So we think the bats have just evolved. The stronger bats are producing stronger offspring. They're better at feeding. The ones that in our caves that didn't die right off mm -hmm. are the ones who did better. They went into hibernation fatter. They picked a better place in the cave. Uh, one thing about bats, you can go into a cave and you can put a band on a bat that's hanging on this nub right here and come back the next year and he's hanging on that nub right there. <laughs> so they have to learn that they should move to a different location. But that's how we know that, that at least one bat has lived to be over 36 years old because it was found in the same cave at the same location for 36 consecutive years. Not because it was dead and hanging there, but because it left and came back. So is this just happening in New England? or is No, it this is all over the United States, Canada. It's all of the caves in, in southern Canada. Uh, bats are found everywhere on this planet except the South Pole and the North Pole. So it's affecting all of the ones everywhere. Of the, any cave bats are impacted by this. Yes, question. Um, has it become an issue in South America? Well, in South America, the temperatures are warm all the time. The food source is available all the time, so there is no hibernating. Mm. Uh, there are some species of bats that move from one cave to another. The bats that are in Bracken Cave in Texas move to southern Mexico and then come back. And that's not an easy thing when you're trying to drive your little moving truck and you have 50 million bats that have to move. It's a lot of little trucks traveling. <laughs> but what about like really, really southern South America? Like um, bottom of Peru, southern. Because it gets yeah, somewhat. It, that's a possibility. I don't, I, I'm not right up on these specific species that are down in the southern part of South America. Uh, so it's possible. Uh, the cave uh, the, w once the fungus got here, it spread so fast, and anywhere that the environment is uh, one that it likes, it will continue to grow. One of the nice things about it, if a bat survives uh, in the cave, survives the winter, and comes out, it's got the fungus on it. But once the temperature gets over 70 degrees as it comes out of hibernation, 
the fungus can't survive. So the fungus dies off naturally on the bat. But here's the, here's the issue. Bats have got this incredible immune system. So this is the effect that white-nosed fungus has on a bat. This is a bat we got out of Dorset Cave. The uh, people from Fish, Fish and Wildlife went up there. They found a bunch of bats out there. They picked them up and brought them to us. So this is a picture when it first came in, April 10th, 2018. If you look closely, you can see on this bat's wings right here. Is my pointer showing up? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right here, you can see a little tight spot right there, a little funny spot on the wing, and over here on the other wing right here. That is a telltale sign that this bat had the fungus growing on it. So we know this bat was infected. So what's the big deal? Well, bats have got this incredible immune system that can fight off anything. Ebola, SARS, um, rabies, COVID. They, are, they have this incredible immune system. When the fungus gets on them, their immune system goes into high gear. This thing has got to go. It's got things growing into my skin and it starts attacking the fungus. And what happens is it attacks the fungus so violently that it rips its own wings apart. So you see, from April 10th to April 26th, this thing has, the wings have just fallen apart. This one, almost all the trailing parts of the wings. This bat could never fly in the wild. Had we gotten this bat and gotten the betadine on it and killed the fungus right away, maybe it wouldn't have gotten this bad. But for the first time ever in 2018, the Vermont Bat Center said, maybe this bat is capable of healing itself. Let's give it warm, good food, high humidity, 98% humidity in its enclosure. So it's almost raining. So here's the bat on May 9th. And it's saying, hey, I can fix this. And it starts regrowing its own wing tissue. And then, it's now on May 30th, it's able to fly. And we released this bat. Unfortunately, we had to release it back where it came from, North Sip, Vermont right back into the cave. <laughs> so hopefully that bat came out tougher than it was when it went in. Yes? Um, how does it regrow? Is, it, is the wing material almost like skin? The wing, is, the wing material is skin. Bats have solid wings like airplanes, which is why when a bat's on the ground, it's in big trouble. It needs air movement over those wings in order to fly. So on the ground, it's got to be able to climb up on something there are a few species that are able to jump. They have strong enough legs and arm movement that they can jump enough to get air under their wings. But if you see a bat here in Vermont on the ground, it's a goner unless it can find something to climb up on. So that's when we uh, encourage people to get a cloth and a pair of gloves, scoop the bat up, carry it over to the base of a big tree so it has a chance to climb up. Yeah. Um, what are the effects of rabies on bats? Because I know they spread it, but like, does it affect them? Like, can it, would it kill them if given enough time? Yes, or would it? it will kill them if given enough time. They are able to fight off the rabies virus for a period of time, but it eventually catches up to them because it's attacking the entire nervous system all at once. And even the bat's immune system can't keep up with that kind of an attack. So a bat that gets rabies may be able to, to survive for months, but then suddenly it just goes downhill very quickly. That's why uh, we often find bats that have flown along, doing perfectly well, all the way through, and here it is July, and we find a bat on the ground, and it's flopping around doing weird things. That's one that has rabies, and it finally caught up to it. So the bat could no longer fight off uh, in fact, yes. So we've always been told that if you wake up in the morning mm -hmm. and there's a bat in your room, mm. you need to be in. You need to get rabies vaccines because the bat could have bitten you in the night. Can you comment on that? I certainly can comment on that. 
If that is the case, you always, always, always in Vermont dial 1-800-4-RABIES and you talk to the people that know and you tell them exactly what your story was and they will tell you. I don't take any, make any attempt at telling people what to do medically. No, no, but my the question rule is of thumb is, if the bat is in your house and is in a room with a sleeping person, then it's possible that you have come in contact. It's not that it bites you, it's that you came in contact with its saliva. The rabies virus is transferred with saliva. So, bats crawling around on your arm and happens to crawl over your finger where you had a hangnail. If the saliva gets into the hangnail, now you are infected with the rabies virus. And that, not such a big deal, except for the fact that in humans, rabies is terminal. Mm -hmm. If you don't get treatment, sayonara. I guess that was my question. I was like, wait, there aren't vampire bats in, in Vermont. But that was the reason. Okay. That's the reason. It's the saliva that is, is the issue. So in the event that you do get bit, you definitely now have a puncture wound, even though no blood, it's a dumb, you can't even see where he bit you. That doesn't matter. It got under the epidermis and that's it. You've been infected with whatever the bat had. So that's why if you call the rabies hotline, 1-800-4-RABIES, they will tell you, after you tell them your story, they'll tell you, there's, yes, there's a chance, or no, there's not, uh, it was in a different room, it was with your husband, we don't like him, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Yes. Do you ban all the bats that you rehab? So yes. can you track them yes. to see? Every bat that we have taken in or that Fish and Wildlife has dealt with have a wing band that says it, on this tiny, tiny little wing band, it says Vermont Fish and Wildlife and then a big long number. So we know every single bat that we've ever taken in. We know for a fact that we had a bat which we raised from baby size. And by the way, when, when you call up and say, we have a baby bat. If it's bigger than the end of your baby finger, it's an adult. <laughs> baby bats are this size. So when we get a baby bat in and we hand raise it, it doesn't know any area. So we release it at our location. And it gets released with its rabies vaccination. So it's not, we know it's not going to get rabies. And it has a band on. So we released a bat. Uh, we have a big enclosure where it learns to fly. We, we listen to the acoustics so we know it's catching bugs. And then we just open the door. And when it is ready, it leaves. When it's, if it wants to stay, some have stayed for weeks and eventually go somewhere else. But we had one that we put out there. And after a couple of weeks, he finally decided he was going to venture outside the door. So we watched him. He ventured outside the door about 10 feet and went right back in. <laughs> Next day, he was feeling much braver. He went out about 30 feet and then went back in. <laughs> and then a couple days later, he just disappeared. And we thought, okay, good for him. We don't have to worry about that guy anymore. October comes along and it starts getting cold. <laughs> we go out in the enclosure. The door's been opened all summer. Go out in the enclosure and darn it, he isn't in there. <laughs> We know it's the same bat because he's got an armband on and we know which one's which. So he, we said, okay, you're not very, being very smart here. We're going to leave you for another week and see what happens. He went sound asleep in the little bat house. We have a bat house out there that's like this. And he just went in there and went to sleep. He said, okay, it's getting cold enough. We better bring you inside. So we brought him inside, made sure he was healthy, checked his weight, put him in our hibernation cave. Next spring, took him outside, put him in the thing. He hung around for a while, eating our mealworms, and then disappeared. In the fall, October gets here, there he is, back at the bat house. He's there waiting for food, and we didn't feed him, so he crawled in and went to sleep. So we brought him in, another overwinter, took him out the next spring. Finally, after three seasons of doing that, he never came back. Now, we don't know whether he never made it or got eaten by something, but we're thinking, oh, yeah, he finally figured out he can stay in the wild. Can you give him a name? We give, uh, uh, back when, when we first started this, uh, our grandchildren named every bat based on the circumstances 
where it was found. This particular one was named Willie. Willie Go or Willie Stay? <laughs> <laughs> we had one that was a, pa a pair of bats that were found in a church basement in a bucket of nails. How they got in there, I don't know. But they were named Spike and Rusty. <laughs> If you go on our Facebook page, you'll find all these crazy <laughs> stories of some really interesting things. Yes? Is it true that if some, an animal has rabies, it will form at the mouth? There are, one of the things that happens when an animal is infected with rabies is its throat begins to constrict, so it can't swallow. So the saliva in its mouth starts building up and that's what you're seeing. It's not foaming because the rabies made it foam. It's foaming because it can't swallow. So it can't take a drink and clean it. It's not foul. So uh, bat, I have never seen a bat that was foaming at the mouth. Some, so some animals do, some animals do. Somebody else had a question? See, I told you, we've been here for four hours and you didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. That's about white-nosed fungus. Uh, and our, our bat species are doing a darn good job of figuring out how to deal with the white-nosed fungus. <clears throat> Let me just do a quick thing of our rehab facility. Uh, bats, unlike people who take care of squirrels and rabbits and foxes and deer, bats are tiny. They're little tiny things. They don't require very much space. Uh, we have enclosures for them for the winter time. And our enclosures are just little enclosures. We have hundreds of them. So in our hibernation cave, every bat that goes in there has its own little space. It's <laughs> like a little vacation villa. <laughs> but this is our facility, a triage area. Those are the, the enclosures that we have. Uh, so we have a triage area where all our meds are kept and uh, every bat that comes in, goes in here, gets checked for everything under the sun to make sure it's healthy, good weight. If it has any problems at all, we take care of it um, to deal with it. We work with two different veterinary services for all of our medications that we need or that the bats need. I'm way beyond medication. <laughs> uh, we have larger enclosures for our little browns that come out of the caves and are not going to go into hibernation again. They're coming out, they're high humidity, a high temperature. So these enclosures can be uh, covered in plastic, have heating pads inside, turn the heating pads up, blast humidity into them so that they are in there in the best possible environment to repair those wings. And by the way, little brown bats and northern long-eared bats, those little tiny species, can fly around in these cages, no problem. They'll, they fly around in circles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have permanent residents or like residents who are so badly injured somehow that they couldn't be released? Well, the, the law says if we can't rehabilitate them in 12 months, they must be euthanized. Mm -hmm. So if we get a bat that comes in to us, we, we have tried for years to allow us to have educational bats, bats that we know are vaccinated against rabies, but they can't be released because they're missing a wing, missing a leg, or whatever. And bats are very intelligent, and they are very friendly. So bats that we've had for a long period of time, uh, they, they are just wonderful ambassadors for the world of bats. But the law says 12 months euthanized. So any bat that we get in and we know it is never going to be releasable. Uh, it's a huge drain on our resources to take care of somebody that after another eight months we're going to have to euthanize anyway. And nobody can come visit us. So all we can do is show you video and mm -hmm. the rare case where I happen to be going to some place where I'm bringing a bat that has to be released <laughs> and I can bring it and those people who want to come watch when I release How it. How do the authorities monitor this period of time? Uh, they, they rely on us as rehabilitators to follow the law. I mean, it's as simple as that. They, they license us. Now, the penalty, of course, is they revoke our license, and since we're the only one in the state, now you got nobody. Uh, so, let's see. We have an indoor 
flight area for our little baby bats. Remember, baby bats come to us. They're less than an inch tall. They get hand fed every hour on the hour, 24 hours a day, until they are up to four grams. That's the weight, just over a dime. Um, and once they get to that size, now we can change to, so we now feed them every three hours. And we, we increase that cycle, but it is intense for about three weeks. Then they're full grown. So once they get to be full grown, we can start feeding them mealworms, teach them how to self-feed, then it's easy peasy from there. But they don't know how to fly. So we have an indoor flight area where we can put them in there, and it's big enough that they can practice flying around before we take them to the outside. Yeah. Two questions. How many steps do you have to feed them once an hour? And is there a time when they're all born, or are they born throughout the year? They're born all different times in the spring. Uh, they are all born between uh, early June and the first week in July, I think is a good estimate. That's when all the pups are born. So if there's a, if you have a bat house and there are 30 bats living in a bat house and half of them are females and half of them have babies, all of a sudden there's going to be a whole bunch of babies. And they fall out of the, the bat house onto the ground and you find them if you can get them back up into the bat house, that's good. If not, then they come to us and we hand raise them from there. And how many people feed them? How many people does it take to feed them? No, how many do you have to feed all these bats? Oh, on our have? staff, our entire staff. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's huge. <laughs> me, me and my wife. Whoa. So you don't yeah. sleep in June. We are the only you. two that are licensed to do that. We do have uh, a board of directors. We're at 501c3. We have a board of directors, and the board of directors happen to be the best bat biologists in Vermont. Some are the best in the country. Um, and when we have, uh, one year we got, uh, we got 53 bats, all from one demolition site, all at the same time. So we sent an email out and said, all hands on deck, 24 hours, come on down. Uh, so when we have an intense operation like that, we have a total of seven people that we can call on. So how do you go about feeding them, physically how do you do this? Um, we have little tiny, tiny nipples and a specialized formula that we feed them with. And the, the, uh, if you can picture the nipple is, uh, oh, I can't think of a, it. It's about this long and about a millimeter wide, tiny little nipple. It's originally designed for very small uh, rabbits and squirrels for rehabbers that deal with those things. But they found those were too big and they had to make a smaller size for bats. So we have really tiny. Uh, it would be the equivalent of a Barbie doll nipple, on little Barbie dolls, uh, play nipples, only smaller. How do you not lose those? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, um, they all get uh, nicely fastened. They're designed to fasten onto a syringe. Not the kind with a needle, just the body of the syringe. They slip right over it. So the point is just the part sticking out. Um, so it's e th there's a bigger base on it than the little nipple. I don't think I even have a picture of those. Uh, this is our hibernation cave. On the left is looking at it from the outside. On the right is the cages all lined up. Uh, every cage has, uh, if, if it was one bat coming from one location, then there's one bat in the cage. Some of these cages have five bats in because they all came from the same house. Somebody was renovating in their attic and they came across a whole bunch of bats that were in there. So they came to us all at once. So in a given winter, we may overwinter 10, 15, 20, or as many as 100. We've had the biggest group that we had was 108 in there at one time. So that's the hybrid. Yes? Can you have different types of species of bats in the same cave? So you might have a little brown one and another yes. type and they, they get along okay? Yep. Those, those cave bats, when we did the uh, review of the species, all those that are cave bats would be found in the same cave. So we'll have northern long ears, small footed, um, and the myotas, the, the little browns, uh, the tricolors, all can be found in Dorset Cave. They are not, 
Uh, in Dorset Cave, you might go in and look up at the ceiling of the cave, and there's a cluster of 200 little brown bats. And then over here, there's a cluster of 50 northern long-eared bats. And over here, there's a cluster. So you wouldn't find a cluster that had 20 other species mixed in. That would be a rarity. Uh, and this is our outdoor flight area where once our little pups or our severely injured that are recovering, we want to make sure they can fly before we send them off. They go out here. Uh, it's 16 by 16 and they can fly around in there. There are bat houses inside there uh, where they can go and rest and we feed them while they're in there and then when we think it's time to go, we just open the door. You know, they either stay or they go. And we have a video surveillance system. Uh, one of the issues with bats, if you go into a room that has bats in our enclosures, they disappear behind their little cloths. They hide. The minute they hear us coming, until they realize we're going to give them food, and then they stick their head out so I give them a mealworm. But if we really want to know how they're doing, we have to be able to see them any time, day or night. So we have a video surveillance set of cameras that is our various in various places throughout the uh, triage area. So if we get somebody that's come in and injured, we can watch them and see how they're performing. And these are all pictures. We already looked at this set with the falling apart wings, so we don't need to do those again. Okay. Any questions? Whew. Yes. Have there been any studies about the effects of wind, wind farms on bats? Well, that is a curious thing. Wind farms do the majority of their power generating during the daylight hours. And once it gets to be dusk and into the nighttime, they produce less than 2% of their power. Bats are curious. So a bat flying around a wind turbine says, what the heck is that thing anyway? And they fly up and investigate. They don't fly up and get hit by the blades. That would be ridiculous. Something with echolocation that can <laughs> dodge your tennis racket. They don't get hit by the blade. They fly up and go behind the blade, which is an extreme low pressure area. And they go behind that blade and instantly their lungs collapse from that low pressure. So they die from the collapsed lungs not from getting hit by the blade. But of course, initially we thought, oh my gosh, they're getting hit by these blades and getting knocked all over the place. Well, they're not. They're dying because they're getting in through that low pressure zone, they're falling to the ground. Originally, we didn't have any idea how many were up there getting uh, killed by these blades because they get eaten so quickly by raccoons and foxes and anything passing by. They love to have a little bat snack on their way. Um, so. What we've realized is, if we were to shut down the wind turbines during migration periods, when the bats are known to go down these flyways, if we just turn them off at dusk, there'll be no more mortality. Because the bats will be flying by, they're on their way to somewhere else, if they're on their migration path. So we just turn them off and turn them back on in the morning. And that has been very successful. There have been a lot of work done on um, acoustic things that will discourage the bats from getting close to the wind turbines anytime. And that's the newest research that's going on. Can these things be put on the top of those big huge nacelles that are up there powering the wind turbine? And when you turn those things on, the bats don't come anywhere near them. I don't know the technical part of that, but I've seen videos of uh, bats flying over a pond just tons and tons of bats flying over a pond. They flick the switch to turn these things on, and in 10 seconds, no bats. Turn it off, a couple minutes later, all the bats are back. So they know it works. I'm trying to convince the power company that they're only $15,000 each. Jeez, you put one up there, and oh my gosh. Well, it costs them forty-five thousand dollars to change the oil and that <laughs> thing. So it's all relative. That's right. <laughs> and it depends on how thick you are. 
All right, bat houses. I have some sample bat houses over here. Now, the, the rule of thumb for a bat house, create something with a three quarter inch space in it and bats will like it. Create something with a quarter inch space or an inch and a half space, they won't like it. How do we know that? Because years ago, a bunch of nutty people like me took part in the North American Bat House Research Project, where we made thousands of bat houses in every shape, size, and configuration, and they all got numbers, and we all reported which ones did the bats go in, at what time of year, and that all was sent back to Bat Conservation International, and it was determined clearly that three-quarter inch spacing is ideal for the majority of the bats in North America. So, if you take two pieces of plywood and put them together with a piece of pine board along the side and across the top and put a fancy roof on it if you want, but leave a three-quarter inch gap, now you have a bat house. So that's, this is the simplest kind of bat house. If you want to get really fancy, you can make a condo that has multiple areas. So you don't need a wire mesh inside? Nope. What you need is a screwdriver that can scratch the surface so it's easy for the bats to land on it and crawl up inside. Uh, in, in the intro, you heard that my wife and I started Chiroptera Cabin Company way, way back. And we made bat houses, and because we were making so darn many, we started that project right at the time when this internet thing <laughs> came along. And we heard, you can put a store on the internet and people will buy stuff. <laughs> so we said, we can do that. So we put up a store right before Christmas, and the next day, we got our first order. And we got... Hundreds over the years, thousands. We made over 4,000 bat houses, and in 2010, we said, that's enough. <laughs> but because we got tired of scratching with a screwdriver, I just created a table saw that had 12 parallel blades on it that would cut grooves in the plywood. So I could take a sheet of plywood and pass it over that thing, zip, 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 and have all the grooves cut all the way to the top in no time. I took it apart, so no, you can't have it. <laughs> so, some of our bat houses and the styles, that's the one we just looked at. These bat houses, by the way, have been with me since we first started this in 1998. I think we first started dragging these two bat houses around. And when bats go into the bat house, they don't spread out. They like their temperature to be between 95 and 100 degrees. And here in Vermont, if you want 95 and 100 degrees, you better paint it black, and you better snuggle up with all your buddies mm -hmm. to keep warm. So these guys are snuggled up. This is looking straight up at the bottom of the bat house, and there are 80 bats in there all crammed together, trying to keep warm. But bat houses are not, they don't have to be a particular size or color, or anything. it's the gap that's mm -hmm. important. So this one was designed for a forest bat to be put up in the woods, not on the side of your house. The ones you put up on your house are for house bats. If you want one for the forest bats, you gotta make it like a tree. Big, tall thing, three quarter inch gaps so they can get in there. And then we have big, huge ones. Anybody ever been to Shelburne Farms? Mm -hmm. To the Inn of Shelburne Farms? If you walk across the grounds at the Inn of Shelburne Farms, Way down at the end of the field, you'll see this giant bat. Oh, look at that handsome guy. <laughs> we put up a bat house there that had the largest known colony of little brown bats. We were trying to convince the bats to get out of the attic of the inn because for some reason, guests at the inn got all upset when the bat ended up in their room. And I kept telling them, bat in the room, double the price. Come on. <laughs> so if you look at this picture, this is standing on the porch, and if you look out across that big, huge lawn, you can see the fire hydrant mm -hmm. and the bat house, way in the back, almost invisible. That has been there, I think we're at 15 years now, and it's started to show its age, so they're working on a new set of bat houses. 
be put up because it, it has, I think the last count was 500 and some bats. Well, little brown. Little brown bats living. So did they leave the attic? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have put up more wire and fencing and sealed up holes and everything. The problem is a bat can get through a space you can get the end of your baby finger in. So that the facility is four stories tall, has been there for like 100,000 years or something, and there are more gaps and openings, and the thing they didn't realize was those massive chimneys are enclosed in a separate enclosure that goes from the basement all the way out through the roof. So if there's one crack in there, a bat can get into that crack and has access to the entire building. It's like... How are you ever going to get them out of there? <laughs> Double the price. <laughs> what is big mesh over the chimney? What's that? Can you just put a big mesh over the chimney top? <laughs> it's not the top. It's the, where the roof comes down and surrounds the chimney or where it butts up against the side of the so building. It's through the masonry. And after all those years, the siding just has to warp a little tiny bit. And now there's a little gap and a bat can land and zoop. We did a... Uh, survey down there one time. In, in the summertime, people eat out on the porch. There's a, a covered porch on the uh, west side of the building. People dine out there, have a wonderful evening, and we were doing a bat count. So we were counting the bats coming out of one of the uh, areas behind the building where one of the chimneys was. And they were coming out along the side of the building and right across above the heads of the diners, <laughs> not just one or two, there were like 50 bats. Yeah. They never even noticed them, because they, they're silent. Mm -hmm. You can't hear them. And it's just poof, and they're gone. Could you put like one of those audio devices that you said repelled bats? You could. They've tried all kinds of things. <laughs> Balloons, uh, tinfoil sheets, uh, anything they could discourage them. These are all different styles of bat houses. This is a, uh, the one that you see there on the left is, is the shape of the bat house. On the right is looking straight up from the bottom of it. It's just rough cut pine right off the lumber yard. Cheap, cheap, cheap. And uh, the big thing, three quarter inch gaps. And you can put up one or two or you can go a little wild <laughs> and put up lots of them. And the thing is, you put a bat house up, that doesn't mean the bats are going to go there. That big one at Shelburne Farms, there was not a single bat in there for five years. Mm -hmm. The sixth year, somebody in the bat group said, hey, look what I found. <laughs> and there were 300 that year. Wow. So it's like, who knew? So you have to be patient. Sometimes you think you've got a great location for a bat house. So you put it up, big open area, right by the water. This is down in, uh, the, off the end of Crown Point Bridge. And no bats ever went in. <laughs> Why not? Because it gets wicked wind coming through there all the time. Mm -hmm. And it never got hot, even with that nice shingled roof. But then you have a big bat house. This is in Canoe Creek, Pennsylvania. 7,000 bats. Whoa. We now have two of these in Vermont. I'm not sure what the uh, population of those houses are, but they're just like this one. Uh, one is in Springfield and the other is in not Springfield, someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> but then down in Florida, at the University of Florida in Gainesville, they had a big, huge uh, educational building and it burned down. And there were thousands of bats living in the attic space of that building that were now displaced. So those thousands and thousands of bats had to go somewhere. Well, it happens the alumni built this beautiful stadium for the Gators, their football team, and behind the seats, there were three quarter inch spaces. <laughs> and the bats all moved in. <laughs> so now you've got all these bats and the alumni said, hey, you got to do something because we can't have these things coming out right in the middle of a game and all the fans are running away. So they built a bat house. So this is the bat house, the first bat house that they built. And this bat house had 70,000 bats living in it. Wow. It started falling apart 
it had so many bats and so much guano, and they never expected that, so it was not really built to rigorous standards. So they built another one. So now they got two, but they had to make the other one a bat barn, because we get the bat house and the bat barn. <laughs> so it didn't take long for both of those to fill up with bats. 140,000 bats. Oh my God. So they built another one. <laughs> there are now over 290,000 Mexican free tail bats living in those bat houses. I think they need a bat hotel now. <laughs> <laughs> and these bats, these bats go out every night and feed, and they consume about 20 tons of bats every night. Bugs, Not yet, 20 bugs, what I said, bats? <laughs> yeah, you didn't tell us about the Don't pay bats. <laughs> <laughs> Then uh, down in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Fish and Wildlife Department, the Pennsylvania Fish and Wildlife Department took over this old church building, abandoned church building, years, many, many, many years ago. Uh, they own exactly the land that it's sitting on. They own, they own I think, one foot around it, and that's it. Where, where these people are standing is a graveyard. So. I use this picture because it, it uh, helps people understand when I say the biggest bat that we have here has a 15-inch wing. Well, I saw a bat. It, it had a wingspan like this big. We saw it fly by, and I took a picture of it. Well, here's a picture. I'm standing. The bat on the left has just flown over my shoulder. These are all little brown bats with an 8-inch wingspan. And if you look way up here... That's the real size. These guys look bigger because of the optical illusion of the shadows mm -hmm. and the proximity to me and my camera. So some of these, look look at the shadow on the lower right. Yeah. It's huge. That thing's like a bald eagle. <laughs> but they're all little brown. So their wingspan is only this big. And this particular, this is one of my early experiences uh, going into an area that had lots of bats in it, and people said, well, aren't you scared? What if they all attack you? Bats yeah. never attack people, ever. Not a single documented case ever of a bat attacking a human. This uh, facility has 20,000 bats living in it, and I stood there while they came out the forest for the night, and they were swirling everywhere, I mean, but never touched me. I could feel wings going by. <laughs> But they never touch me. They don't care about me. I'm just an obstacle. They're trying to get by me to get out the door. <laughs> we do a program each, each year up until COVID. We do a program down in uh, Shelburne Farms. Uh, and at the end of the program, we go into one of the big barns down there where they have a large colony of bats. And we have everybody go in. They're all prepared for this. They're told to wear hats so you don't get poop in your hair. Uh, Bring a flashlight if you want. So we all go and we stand in this open area. And we turn off the flashlights and everybody is very quiet. And we turn on our acoustical monitors and we hear a bat. Dit, 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 dit. Bat go by. And then another dit, 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 dit. You can hear the echolocation. And then we hear dit, 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 dit. And pretty soon it's a cacophony of noise. Just bats everywhere. And it's like, okay, everybody, turn your flashlights on. And they turn their flashlights on and they realize we're standing in a group like this and the bats are going pew, pew, pew. right by. It's like, now I'm scared. I didn't, when I couldn't see them, I didn't know they were going right by my ear. So they are masters of flight. They don't care about humans. They're just an obstacle in the way. And these guys are doing their thing. They're going out and eating bugs. Um, you say they get rabies. Doesn't rabies usually cause like hyperaggression, at least in mammals? In, in terrestrial mammals, that would be the case. In bats, they will fly until they can't fly anymore and fall to the ground. And if you observe a rabid bat on the ground, it is not just flopping trying to fly. It's rolling over on its back. It's making weird screaming noises. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's in extreme pain. It's already reached that point where it has... Uh, its nervous system has started to break down. None of its 
brain functions are working properly. It has no control over any of its muscles because its nerves aren't working. So uh, they are not aggressive. They are just on the ground and they're going to die. It's not going to be another hour or two and they're out. Mm -hmm. so, At that point, would it just be time to like, shoot them or something? Because... Well, see, t technically, it is not legal for just the average Joe to go out and kill a wild animal unless it's part of the whole hunting regimen. So the proper thing to do in that case is to get in touch with either Fish and Wildlife or us so we can evaluate the situation and make the determination, yes, this bat needs to be euthanized. Jump in your car down there in Brattleboro and just make the three and a half hour drive up here so we can euthanize it. Or, since nobody does that, or we will tell you a way of humanely euthanizing it and you have our permission to do that. How do you humanely euthanize a rabbit bat? Um, you, you, not just Terrible a rabbit bat, a, a, bat <laughs> a bat that your cat caught and has its wing ripped off. Oh. No chance of survival. It's still alive, it's going to die a horrible death. So we get a call, I had a call today about that. Somebody had a bat, their uh, dogs had caught it and tore the wing off, both up to date on their rabies vaccinations, so there's no danger for the dogs. What do we do with it? Well, you can, they were in South London dairy. So you can jump in your car and drive up here from South London Dairy so I can euthanize it, or you can euthanize it yourself. The best method for euthanizing it is a sharp, fatal blow. Instantaneous. It can't be, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's got to be wham. So it, death has to be immediate. Sorry. <laughs> this is one of nature's bat houses that is home to a group of Indiana bats, one of the really endangered species. So there we got Indiana bats in one of nature's bat houses. Been there for a long time. It's someday going to fall over, and Fish and Wildlife has that, that bat house I showed you that was the big tall one. They have four of those. So when and if this tree goes down, they have four that they can put up in the area so they don't lose that colony. I'm sorry, why would they not put that up preemptively? We don't like to interfere with a healthy known colony of endangered animals. Because that's exactly what I asked them. How, why don't we just put them up? Well, we really shouldn't be interfering. So we're, we're at the ready. And if something happens to that tree, we can have it up in a, very quickly. But in general, you would encourage people to put up bat boxes? Just yes. Not in such a not, specific situation as that. Right. Especially if you, have a, um, if you have a known colony of little brown bats living in your attic. They're on our threatened species list. They've been on the endangered species list. We want to provide them with housing in the event that you are going to do renovations in your attic. So let's get the bat houses up now so they can discover them and two years from now when you tear your attic apart, they'll have some place to go. So we always want to be proactive in that way. But when Mother Nature's got things under control, it's a, an iffy thing. This is a bat house that was uh, built by Joe Gardner. It's been put up down at Kingsland Bay State Park. Um, it was actually put up with the huge assistance of Green Mountain Power, who sent two line crews and these trucks that picked this thing up. They put the poles in the ground. They are uh, environmentally friendly poles. They are not treated with creosote. They're treated with some natural uh, antifungal stuff that will keep them there for years. And the idea was, let's make one that kind of fits the environment down there, a log cabin, would be appropriate. So, so far nobody's moved in. <laughs> then, over by Vermont Public Radio, got another huge bat house <sighs> that's over there. If you ever go to Vermont Public Radio in the uh, Burlington area, Colchester, Colchester um, when you're driving in that drive to get there, look off to the left. You probably wouldn't notice it unless you knew to look there. 
And this is another one, the Green Mountain Power basically provided us with these crews that they're getting to be experts at putting bad houses up. <laughs> so they arrived with these things and the I was felt like an idiot the first time that they came. I said, boy, are your truck's going to be able to lift that thing up? It probably weighs 1,500 pounds. I said, our trucks can lift 7,000 pounds each. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So does any bats go in? Uh, this one has no bats in it either. It's one of those things where you can go look underneath and try and find guano. You can shine your light up inside, see if there's anybody in there. Uh, and so far, no takers. But we do know from our experience down in Shelburne Farms, you can go for years with a bat house that's checked on all the time and not have any bats, and then all of a sudden, there they are. So anyway, I ran out of slides. Well, actually, I, I have a few hundred more, but <laughs> it's now quarter of eight, so if you were supposed to be somewhere at 7.30, you're late. So I'm going to be going from here down to the golf course and releasing our Randolph bat. To the main entrance. You are welcome to come. And By the driving range, right? By the driving range, yes. The former driving range, I guess? What else is? No. Where's the driving range? And were you serious when you said it will probably try to find the house? Oh it will go to the house? That it, <laughs> it doesn't have to try and find it. It knows just, exactly. It'll just, it's just going to go. Yeah. It's going to go. He's going to go fly around, realize he's free, catch a couple of bug snacks, and then over oh, to Harvey's. Harvey's house. Right there before he will. <laughs> the, the, uh, we have released many bats where we turn them loose and we watch them. They go out. They make a couple of circles around to figure out where they are, and zoom. So this one came from Harvey's house? This one came from Harvey's house. <laughs> so what were the circumstances? Uh, they found it on the floor of their cold room uh, in their, I think it was in the, the barn. Uh, it came out of hibernation early, and I think we got it, when did we get it? Beginning of April, maybe, I think. and. Uh, Harvey called me up this morning. Harvey and I have known each other in our woodturners circle for years, and he called me up this morning and said, I just read Front Porch Forum. You're going to be down in Randolph doing a bat program. I'm going to be up in your area at a board meeting. <laughs> so I'm going to miss it. I said, okay. Uh -oh, I probably